Marilyn worked at one of the best clinics in the city as a surgeon. It was the woman's dream. Her mother, Helen Avila, did not approve of her daughter's choice to dig into human bodies all her life. Yes, saving lives is a noble and honourable mission, but let someone else do it. And her Marilyn, a fragile and calm girl, could be a neurologist, an ophthalmologist, a general practitioner at worst. But Marilyn said firmly, no, only a surgeon. It should be said that during her work in the clinic, she showed herself only in the best light, and she was already entrusted with quite complex operations. She was often called in on weekdays and holidays. Oh, daughter, you'll never get married like this, sighed Mrs. Avila. Oh, mummy, as if getting married is the main purpose in life. Yes, you are a woman, and I don't need to explain to you that our female age is not long. The clock is ticking after all, the mother kept arguing. Let them tick. Marilyn waved her hand. The last time she had a relationship, it was in college with a classmate. Then he cheated on her with her best friend. Since then, Marilyn had gotten rid of her friends and kept her distance from men, so as not to experience all that pain again. However, she was a real beauty. Curly blonde hair, white porcelain-like skin, brown eyes, such a doll. Only this doll had a steel character. What to do? The profession left an imprint on her. That evening, Marilyn had already left the clinic. It was a tough shift. Two planned minor surgeries in the morning, and then several hours of surgery on a guy after a car accident. And now, nothing threatened his life. Marilyn was tired. She walked along the path of the hospital park, and already imagined how she would finally enter their apartment with her mother after quickly taking off boots, jacket, and taking a bath. She would be basking in a snow-white bath with fluffy blackberry foam for an hour, and then she would flop into bed and disappear into the realm of Morpheus. Suddenly she heard a heavy groan. Marilyn stopped and looked around in confusion. It was already late October outside, and it was getting dark early, and this evening it had already frozen quite a bit. Marilyn shivered from the cold and looked closely at the nearest bushes. It seemed to her that the groan was coming from there. "'Who's there?' she asked loudly, and boldly stepped towards the withered, huge bush, taking her phone as a flashlight. In the next second, she saw a person lying on the ground. He writhed in pain, gasped for air with his lips, trying to shout something, but only a sound that sounded more like a moan came out of his throat. Marilyn approached closer. In the light of the phone, she saw a miserable man and recoiled. He was a real bum, dressed in some rags of an indefinite age. His hair had grown to a disheveled mess, his beard was grey, and there was the smell that confirmed once again, in front of her, was a person who had fallen to the bottom of society. Maybe he's drunk, she thought doubtfully, but then she realised that she was trying to find a reason not to get closer and felt ashamed of it right away. As a doctor, she understood that the person needed urgent medical help. Are you okay? she asked, sitting down next to the bum. He looked at her with eyes full of pain and despair, and again he only groaned, curling up into a ball and holding his stomach. Let me see what's wrong with you. I'm a doctor, Marilyn said softly, touching the unfortunate man's hand. From the calm voice, from the humane attitude that this tramp had already forgotten, he froze. Marilyn took his hand off his stomach and only made a few manipulations, realizing immediately that it was appendicitis, possibly peritonitis, that had begun. There was no time to lose. I'll help you now, she said. Just hold on a little longer. Marilyn dialed the phone of the emergency room of her clinic and called the orderlies. A patient in the park? The nurse was surprised. Then you need an ambulance. We're a private clinic, not governmental, and they don't bring such people to us. The person needs emergency surgery. He may not make it to another hospital. Carrie, quickly send the orderlies to help me bring him to the clinic and prepare the operation room. Marilyn commanded the nurse. Carrie couldn't disobey the surgeon's command, and now the orderlies were running down the park path with a stretcher. 
Upon seeing the person Marilyn had found, the staff were stunned. Dr. Avila, are you sure we can take him in? One of the men doubted. Are you suggesting we leave him here? Marilyn objected. But he's a homeless person, and we're an elite clinic. First and foremost, he is a human being, so take him carefully, commanded Marilyn, who knew there was not a minute to lose. The orderlies obediently did what the doctor had told them. In the reception room, everyone was shocked. The duty doctor refused to operate on the man without permission of the head doctor. Marilyn took charge and ordered the orderlies to clean the patient up and take him to the first operating room. Your shift is over, Dr. Avila. The ambulance will take him now, the duty doctor said. And where will they take him? To the third clinic? Where do they take everyone like him? Marilyn frowned. It takes more than an hour to get there, and he already has peritonitis. He'll die on the way. So what? We're supposed to collect all the mud? We're an elite clinic. He has all sorts of infections. Good sterilization of the operating room is all we need. It's not a problem, Marilyn retorted, and she personally rolled the homeless man on a stretcher into the processing room, and the nurses followed hesitantly. They understood that, as a human being, Marilyn was right, but they wondered what the chief doctor would say about this. Dr. Cosimano had already left the clinic for the day, but they knew he would find out tomorrow. Girls, I take full responsibility, Marilyn said, seeing the nurse's doubt. Quickly, get him ready. I'm going to the operating room. The elderly anesthesiologist said nothing. He was still of the old school, and everyone was equal on the operating table for him. He approved of Marilyn's actions and tried not to think about the chief doctor's reaction, but he had no doubt that there would be a scandal tomorrow. The operation was successful, though not without difficulties. You made the right decision, Marilyn, the anesthesiologist told her. The old man would have died if you had sent him to another hospital. That's what I thought, Marilyn nodded. But get ready, you'll be having a hard day tomorrow, the anesthesiologist warned. What? Is our Dr. Cosimano not a human being? Marilyn shrugged. He's a businessman first. Who's going to pay for this homeless man? He doesn't even have any documents, the anesthesiologist reminded her. Oh my God, let him lie for a couple of days. Then we'll transfer him to another clinic. Oh girl, you're so naive, said an old doctor shaking his head. But Marilyn was sure that the chief doctor would understand her. She didn't get home until late at night. What kind of bath with blackberry foam could she have here? She barely washed herself up, made it to the bed and collapsed onto the pillow, sinking into a deep sleep. The next morning, the chief doctor called and yelled at her that she had created unsanitary conditions and violated the rules of the clinic. What am I supposed to do now? Close the clinic for quarantine? Dr. Cosimano shouted. Why quarantine? We've taken all the express tests from him, an x-ray, everything's fine with him. Marilyn replied calmly. Dr. Cosimano, he would have died if I hadn't performed the emergency operation. So what? Who is he to you, your father, brother, husband, or uncle? This homeless old man has long since died for society. The chief doctor raged. Dr. Cosomano, excuse me, but you're not reasoning like a doctor, Marilyn dared to say. How dare you talk back to me? The chief doctor shouted. You're fired. The courier will deliver your papers and forget about the money. All your earnings will go to cover the clinic's losses. What losses? Marilyn bitterly smiled, her hands trembling with indignation. For the clinic's sterilization. The chief doctor bellowed, then hung up. After the conversation, Marilyn was beside herself. She didn't even feel the tears running down her face. She just stood by the window, and the tears flowed. Daughter, are you crying? Mrs. Avila approached Marilyn cautiously. What was the conversation about? The chief doctor called, Marilyn said, wiping away her tears. Mum, I was fired. Then she told the whole story while her mother listened and shook her head. Lord, what times we live in. We now have people and not people. And there are 
inhumane people as well, Marilyn replied, calming down. Like Dr. Cosimano, for them only status and money matter, and human life is worth nothing. Don't worry, daughter, her mother comforted Marilyn with a hug. You did everything right. I'm sure someone up there is watching all of this very carefully. It will be credited to you. Credited, Marilyn said, smiling sadly. But now I am unemployed. How will I live? I have to find a new job. Although I'm not certain that Dr. Cosomano won't put me on a blacklist, and no one will hire me after that. Well, damn them, Mrs. Avila waved her hand. You can become a pharmaceutical representative. They earn pretty well. But I'm a surgeon, Mum. I'm used to saving people, not pushing unknown pills on them. Although, maybe you're right. Well, we'll see. Meanwhile, Dr. Cosomano had already called other clinics and warned his colleagues not to hire Marilyn under any circumstances. At that moment, his alarmed secretary knocked on his door. Dr. Cosimano, we're having an inspection, she whispered frantically. My friend works at the Ministry of Health. She called to warn us that they're coming unexpectedly. Damn it, Dr. Cosimano exclaimed. Everything is not good. Has that bum already been taken away? No, they're waiting for the ambulance. When will it arrive? He dialed the phone number of the head of the therapeutic department, shouted at him, and ordered to get rid of the homeless man. Even if you throw him under a bush, I don't care, the chief doctor shouted. I have an inspection from the Ministry of Health, and there's a bum lying here, undocumented, unverified. Take him to the far end of the park. Let the ambulance pick him up from there. The unfortunate patient was being taken out when people from the Ministry of Health appeared in the doorway. They had already passed by, but one man suddenly wondered where they were taking the patient. Outside? Where is the ambulance? It should be here any minute, Dr. Cosimano replied. The patient had urgent surgery and is now being transferred for treatment. The man from the Ministry of Health turned to the door, looked out the window. The ambulance has already arrived. He has already passed by the patient, but he suddenly looked at his face and froze. Dad? The man exclaimed and ran to the stretcher. Is that you? The homeless man on the stretcher just lay there, looking at the men with confusion. But more often than not, he fixed his gaze on Brad. Yes, he certainly knew him from a past life before the tragedy happened to him. He just couldn't remember exactly. But the man called him Dad. So, he's his son? Dad, do you recognize me? Brad scrutinized the familiar features and couldn't believe that his father, whom they had been searching for almost two years, having lost all hope of finding him alive, was lying in front of him on a stretcher like this, emaciated, with a beard and hair that had grown almost to his shoulders. This story happened over a year ago. Mr. Reed had just celebrated his 60th birthday at the time and was planning to gradually retire from his business related to medical equipment. He wanted his son to leave his bureaucratic job at the Ministry of Health and engage in real business. But Brad was being stubborn, saying that he liked his job and that he was not a businessman at all. This all saddened Mr. Reed a lot. Who would he pass on his business to? His wife had a son from her first marriage and Mr. Reed adopted him many years ago. Chad was older than Brad, but he had no head for business. Chad had ruined everything in no time. However, Mr. Reed didn't have any other options. Therefore, he wrote a power of attorney for Chad and started gradually teaching him the business. And then Mr. Reed was attacked. A black jeep cut off his SUV on the road and some muscle-bound guys jumped out and hit him on the head. After that, the old businessman only remembered how he was flying with the car into the river. He managed to get out of the sinking car, and then a memory gap. He woke up on the shore, his head hurt, his limbs were like wood, and most importantly, he didn't remember anything. On the shore, two homeless men were warming themselves by a fire nearby. Mr. Reed went to them. When they saw an old man with a bloody head, they offered to help to take him home. But where to go? 
Mr. Reed didn't remember anything. So Mr. Reed became a tramp, without memory, without a past. Other homeless people called him Tom. Why Tom? They just had to call him something. Meanwhile, Mr. Reed's relatives were reported by the police as having found the car in the river, but nobody was found in it. The current was so strong that they could search for several years and still not find anything. Brad didn't believe that his father was dead and kept looking for him, but being in the same city, they walked on different streets. They never met, and Chad quickly took on the role of the company's leader and began to build the business in his own way, and he messed it up, causing the father's business to go bankrupt. Brad was furious with his brother. He ruined their father's business. How do they tell him about it when he comes back? People don't come back from the dead, Chad smirked. And yet Mr. Reed came back. Yes, that was him lying on the couch. Brad immediately ordered that his father be taken to a ward and provided with the best care. No one argued with him. The chief physician now only gave orders what and how to do. Brad did not care why his father was going to be transferred to another clinic. He was worried about other thoughts. How to restore his father's memory. It was clear that he had amnesia. But then he accidentally overheard a conversation between two nurses. He was standing in the sanitation room and the girls were chatting in the corridor. Just imagine, said one of them. Our chief is currently scrambling to please the old man, but he fired Dr. Avila. For what? She saved this homeless man's life. Don't even talk about it. Poor doctor. Such a capable doctor. Her hands are golden, added the second nurse. Injustice was, is, and will be. So, maybe we should tell the man from the Ministry of Health about who saved his father and who suffered because of it. Oh no, we'll end up being the scapegoat. At this moment, Brad appeared from behind the door. Excuse me, but I heard everything, he said directly. Let's talk about what really happened there. The nurses blushed and started denying it, but Brad had his own methods of influence. He could also fire anyone, and it worked. The girls told him who found Brad's father, how Marilyn went to surgery without listening to anyone, how the chief yelled on the phone when he laid her off, and how he wanted to push the patient out just after the operation anywhere, even on the street, just so the inspectors from the Ministry of Health wouldn't find a person without documents in the clinic. After hearing all of this, Brad headed to the chief doctor's office. Dr. Cosomano was in a great mood. The inspection never took place and he could finally breathe a sigh of relief. And the fact that the homeless person turned out to be the inspector's father was even better for him. Dr. Cosomano had already come up with his own version of how they saved the old man in the clinic. Yes, they wanted to transfer him, but everything was according to the rules. Don't worry, Dr. Cosomano smiled when he saw Brad at the door of his office and said, Your father will receive the best care. I have no doubt, answered Brad. Then he sat across from the chief doctor and looked him in the eye, saying, Now, of course, he'll receive the best care, because you know who his son is. But before that, you wanted to throw him out like a dog. What are you talking about? You're mistaken, stammered Dr. Cosimano, blushing. And you fired the surgeon, the woman who saved my father. She left on her own. You're lying. I know everything. So, here's what you're going to do now. You're going to personally go to her and bring her here. Understood, nodded the chief doctor. I'll be quick and he literally ran out of the office, leaving Brad alone. When Marilyn saw the chief doctor on the doorstep of her apartment, she was bewildered. Did he personally bring her documents? Marilyn, forget everything I said to you. I was wrong. Forgive me, he said quickly, nervously fiddling with his button. Let's go to the clinic. There you will meet the son of this old man on whom you operated. Marilyn, you're wonderful. It turns out to be the father of the boss from the Ministry of Health. Marilyn was surprised. What was he doing on the street? Oh, there's a dark story there. The police will deal with it now. Marilyn hesitated, but then she thought, I love my job. Okay, 
I'll put my pride aside. So she went to the clinic with the chief doctor. Brad, seeing the young surgeon, was surprised. She's just a girl. Well done. She wasn't afraid to go against established rules. She's brave. Thank you for rescuing my father. From now on, work calmly. No one will fire you again, he said. Dr. Cosomano realized his mistake and nodded his head like a bobblehead. Marilyn struggled to hold back her laughter, finding him pathetic. Several months passed and Mr. Reed was released from the hospital. Marilyn continued working at the clinic and the incident was soon forgotten. Then a rumor spread through the city claiming that Chad, Mr. Reed's adopted son, was guilty of attempting to murder the elderly businessman. He had ordered the hit to accelerate the process of inheriting the business. Chad was currently under investigation and Mr. Reed's memory was slowly returning. Although he was no longer involved in the business, he had a caring son to support him in his old age. Chad was given a suspended sentence, thanks to Brad, who hired a good lawyer at Mr. Reed's request. After the trial, Chad left the city and cut off communication with his family. The chief doctor at the clinic was amazed when he learned these details. And how does the earth carry such horrible people? The chief doctor marveled when he learned these details. How can a man do such a thing? His subordinates listened to him and only nodded, then smiled. Who would speak about honor and morality? Later, an inspection at the clinic revealed that the chief doctor had been illegally appropriating state funds for personal gain. He was tried, given a suspended sentence, and banned from practicing medicine. Marilyn kept working as a surgeon, but now, after a day at work, she is rushing, not home to her mother, but on a date. She started dating Brad, and they are getting married soon. Although he is older than Marilyn, the age difference is not noticeable, because love knows no boundaries.